Every year, thousands of human remains are found in the United States, and in one of every four instances, authorities can't identify the body. That's starting to change. I'm Dave Killen, co-host of The Unidentifieds, a new limited series podcast from The Oregonian and Oregon Live. We go deep into several cold cases and explain the science that's helping experts give these long-forgotten people their names back. Look for The Unidentifieds after you've finished listening to this podcast. Subscribe to The Unidentifieds on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts. NIL Now with Lauren Sisler and Kevin Jones. If you want to learn more about name, image, and likeness, you need to go to The Source. The NIL Now podcast from Headline Studio and Reddit highlights the biggest storylines with comments from key guests in the college and high school NIL space. NIL is not a cherry on top. It needs to be thought about as a part of these young men and women's future to, you know, further their careers. You should be able to leave college with something. Subscribe to NIL Now on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Happy Friday, Friday. However you want to talk about it, we have reached the end of the week. And what a better way to end the week than with my good friend and special guest and contributor, Lance Reisland, who I haven't had on in quite some time, who joins me to break down the best film of all eight of the Bengals draft picks. Welcome into a special post-draft edition of the Strictly Stripes podcast. Muhammad Ahmad joined by, as I mentioned, and I'll keep mentioning it, my good friend, Lance Reisland. Lance, how long has it been since I've had you? It's been at least two weeks, maybe three. I think yeah, three couple, weeks. Yeah, about three weeks. Yeah, cut. We get you uh, get, got going in the draft stuff. So we talked a little bit, and then uh, I knew we'd get together soon. So I appreciate you having me again. But yeah, it's been a couple weeks. Yeah, I was about to say. I know you. You were probably just itching. You have your scouting notes in front of you. For those who can't see it, you've got your. You know, you got your thinking hat on, like you literally have a hat on, and I think that's probably what you would call your thinking hat. So uh, I know you're eager to uh, break down these draft picks who I know you and I were texting about, you know, as the picks were coming in over the weekend. Um, But really, there's no other place to start than number one, you know, the Bengals' first-round pick, Miles Murphy, the edge rusher out of Clemson, and an interesting connection that I don't think I mentioned when we did our post-draft pods his defensive line coach, Nick Eason, was the same positional coach for the Bengals uh, before he went to Clemson. <laughs> and ironically, the guy that replaced him, Marion Hobby, who is going to be Murphy's new coach at the D-line, used to coach at Clemson. So in a way, Eason and uh, uh, Hobby indirectly traded places. So, yeah, you got the, the Bengals-Clemson pipeline. He's lining up to Nick. So next to DJ Reader, who's a fellow Clemson Tiger, you know, you're bringing D-line you to Cincinnati. And so I guess on that note, Lance, I mean, how much of that Clemson D-line you is Miles Murphy going to bring to Cincinnati from what you've seen on his film? Well, first of all, you know, he has, you know, his last year he had 13 and a half sacks, 25 tackles for a loss. But the thing I like the most is that he had 54 quarterback pressures. And as you watch his film, uh, he's constantly in the backfield. Now, when his motor's going, uh, he is – I think he's a steal for where the Bengals got him, if you want to know my honest opinion. I think he's an elite talent. Uh, he's one of the few guys that I've talked to today uh, about him today early on is his ability to go from speed to power or power to speed. A lot of DNs will use their speed rush. A lot will use their bull rush. Uh, but his ability at his height and weight, you know, being 200, you know, almost 70 pounds, he's able to do both of those at a very high level. Uh, he's only going to get better, obviously, as he gets older. Um, I love his, you know, he's got a very advanced pass rush uh, uh, skill set for a college kid. Uh, his closing speed is next level in terms of running down the line of scrimmage, both in the pass and run game. Um, really like his ability to, um, <clears throat> when he engages, he has a, uh, a, the ability to find the ball because he has great extension. Uh, so he does all these things at a high level. Um, you know, a couple things I'll have to worry on is obviously with his size, he's always been able to win uh, without always being fundamentally right. So at times he will be too high. At times he won't use his hands properly. Um, and he's got to be consistent with his speed to power because he's really tough to block when he does that. Uh, again, a guy who's high level, high level skill set, um, really good pick for the Bengals, um, even though it's 
not late, but for where I think he, I think he's a top 10 talent for sure. So if he's such a top 10 talent, I mean, without speaking for like the other 27 teams that passed him, how do you look at a guy like that where no disrespect to Lucas Van Ness and Will McDonald, but like guys like that get picked and he falls all the way to the Bengals. Like what did the team not see that they should have seen from Miles Murphy? Well, you know, I would say, you know, occasionally um, he's not playing at the highest level he can. So one of the big red flags I would say in terms of people who would back off is that he's not a hundred percent all the time. It doesn't seem like it is. Uh, He does. He doesn't bend. Um, quite as well as some guys like, you know, that Miles Garrett bend, but it's pretty good. Um, you know, and at times he, at times he gets clogged up. He, like I said, fundamentally, he's not great in terms of his hands. So he has a lot of stalemates in college where he doesn't really use his hands very well or technique very well. And he's kind of just stuck there. Uh, I used to, I used to call it stuck in mud or be a magnet where he's just both the offensive, the offensive lineman and defensive lineman are just kind of standing there. And, you know, occasionally during games, he goes away. And a lot of it has to do with schemes, right? They're doubling him and, and, and doing certain things to him, and that makes it tough for him. Uh, but if you're an elite top 10 guy, which his talent tells you he is, then people sometimes expect more, uh, even when you're doubled, even when you're tripled. You know, the Miles Garrett, you know, Miles Garrett, Miles is complete, constantly getting doubled, and they, people still expect him to make plays. So I would say that he just kind of goes away. Fundamentally, he's not as good as he could, as he will be. Um, and he doesn't bend right now quite as well as some of these speed rush, um, you know, some of the things they want in a speed rusher. So I think things he can fix, but he's got a pretty high upside. That's for sure. I mean, you're looking at a guy who's 6'5", just about 275 pounds, and he ran a 4.53. Lance, he ran a 4.53. I'm going to say it for the third time. He ran a 4.53. There are guys smaller than that who can't even run a speed like that. And they were saying if he didn't zigzag at his pro day, we're looking at a 4-4-6, Like, does that make you want to jump out of your chair when you hear that? Yeah, you know what? And his 10-yard split's really good. So he's explosive. His 10-yard split is extremely explosive, which for me is more important than that 40 for O-lineman, D-lineman. Um, but what he does is he – he you can see it. There's sometimes he has things you cannot teach. And – um, those those skill sets that you cannot teach at that level um, are hard to come by. And he's a guy who has elite talent. Um, you know, it could be need. It could be, you know, guys, you know, guys talk to each other about, uh, you know, I, and I never really saw an effort thing, but I have heard that he doesn't, you know, maximize his effort all the time. Um, I did not see it on film. What I saw on a film was an elite DN who's 6'5", who runs really well. <laughs> That's what I saw. His closing speed is fantastic. His ability to use his hands is fantastic. Um, but I tell you what, he's a guy with all those skills. He should make even more plays. Even though he makes a lot, he should make even more plays because of the things you're saying. Yeah, I mean, we're going to see exactly how he's used because, you know, he's still going to have to play behind Sam Hubbard and Trey Hendrickson, uh, especially, you know, with Trey Hendrickson going into his second to last year of his deal where he's a big cap casualty. So, I mean, if it's one of those situations where Hendrickson doesn't perform, but Murphy does, you could be looking at the future uh, on the other side of the D line there with Sam Hubbard. But, you know, that's just something that we're going to have to wait to see through training camp, through, you know, just the off season and, you know, kind of seeing how the coaches, you know, and Zach Taylor use him early on. Uh, but to kind of shift over to the second pick, I mean, DJ Turner, the second, I think this is an interesting pick because, you know, it's just like what they did last year. They picked Cam Taylor Britt in the second round. They pick another cornerback in the second round. He's reunited with his former Michigan teammate, Dax Hill, who the Bengals picked in the first round last year. So clearly, you know, the Bengals are really uh, building up their secondary with the loss of Jesse Bates, Von Bell leaving, and Chidobi Awuzie is in a contract year. I mean, without focusing too much on if Turner is the future for Chidobi Awuzie, who's also going to be a free agent next year, I mean, how much do you anticipate that DJ Turner can make an impact in 2023 and potentially replace Awuzie beyond that as a full-time starter? Well, the first thing he does, he, bring, he brings elite, split, uh, elite speed. So one of the, one of the overlying um, themes of the Cincinnati Bengal um, draft was speed. So he was the fastest. He ran, you know, he's a he's a four two nine guy. So he ran a legit, which is incredibly fast. So you're talking about updating uh, your speed in the AFC, which for me allows him to carry um, vertical passes deep better. So he's going to be able to keep things in front 
uh, a lot better than what they're doing now. It, 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 you know, they need to keep things in, in front a little bit more, and he can carry those verticals. Now, his size, um, he's scrappy, but his size does show up at times in terms of 50-50 balls and in the run game. He'll throw his body in there, but he's only 180 pounds. Now, in terms of playing zone, playing man, he's as good as he gets. He's very good. He's very he's very good at mirroring. He's very good with his hands. He's very good at press. Uh, he understands pass concepts coming from a hardball coach football team. So he understands what he's doing. Uh, he's got a really high ceiling. He'll hit, ceiling his speed makes up for any lack of size that he has. Again, if he's if he's uh, you know if he's six foot closer to two hundred pounds, you know he's he's off the board already. So he's a guy that again, really good choice here. Uh, improves their secondary, improves their special teams. Uh, gives their def- their back, uh, their umbrella, their back umbrella a lot more speed. So I think it was a very good pick here. Do you think the Bengals not only made a good pick, like you mentioned, but did they make a sneaky pick where maybe he plays better than guys like Keely Ringo and maybe plays better than guys like Emmanuel Forbes, who I thought was an interesting first round pick? Because I will say I did not expect Forbes to go as high as he did. I think he was 16th to Washington. I mean, could you see Turner like outplaying guys that like people thought would go higher than him? Well, you know, his speed will give him, you know, when you have that elite speed, the thing that Forbes has that I really love is his ability to get in and out of breaks. His hips are incredibly fluid, so he can backpedal, get into it, and he can break out routes uh, as good as anybody in the draft. You know, um, <clears throat> Turner's ability to get in and out of his breaks is high level and his speed, his closing speed and his catch-up speed um, give him a chance to be pretty good early. So when he's going to get, he's going to get beat by NFL receivers. He's a young kid, but his ability to close gives him a chance to play and play early because he'll be able to cover ground better than anybody else. Uh, Forbes is just really good at mirroring. He's very good. I'd say his, his, his best attribute is his hips where uh, Turner's best attribute is his raw speed. Uh, but things he can work on. He's highly athletic. His hips are good, too. Um, he's he's had to rely on his speed. So he'll, um, you know, guys who are fast like that often kind of, I don't want to say they get lazy, but they have, once they get to the NFL and now everybody's fast, they get more tuned into their technique and their fundamentals and their schemes. So, yeah, I, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be shocking. He's a high-level kid. Again, he's a guy who has to make, with his skill set, he's got to make even more plays than he makes now. You know, one of the interesting things that they did with Dax Hill last year was he was drafted as a safety, but they used him as a flexible slot corner when guys like Jalen Davis and uh, Mike Hilton, you know, were injured kind of down the stretch last year. I mean, could you see a situation where maybe, you know, DJ Turner is kind of used as that guy? Like, I know he mostly played outside in college, but could you see it making sense where he is that Dax Hill, where he maybe is a flexible, like, inside nickelback against, you know, slot receivers? Well, yeah, there's two reasons. Two reasons that he'd be a good guy is size. First of all, so many guys in the AFC are good in the slot. So many teams have good third, uh, third receivers that can run. Puts him, to the, puts him closer to the line of scrimmage. And even though he's small, like I said, he's a willing tackler. Sometimes he can't make the tackle because he's, he's on, the, on the smaller side. But the thing I really like about him playing in there is these mobile quarterbacks that you have in the AFC. AFC. So him being in the box uh, or close to the box in, in allows him to uh, close on those quarterbacks, those mobile, the Deshaun Watsons. Uh, uh, of the AFC. So I think th- his speed in the box, not only in coverage, but in the run game and the quarterback run game would be really beneficial for the Bengals. You know, to that note, that is a good transition point, I think, to, you know, the Bengals third round pick. And the one that I still think, I don't want to say it's controversial because he's not a controversial person, but the most controversially thought out pick, I guess, and that's obviously, you know, Alabama safety, Jordan Battle, who, Granted, and I, I think you'll agree with me on this, um, you know, I know that you elaborate, but, you know, a great player, great value pick. I mean, beyond just the character statements that Zach Taylor and Louie Narumo had about, you know, him being a team captain at Alabama and playing at St. Thomas Aquinas in Florida, which, I mean, for those who don't know, guys like the Bosa brothers and Geno Atkins came out of a school like that. Giovanni Bernard, former Cincinnati Bengal, for those who don't know, I mean, went there. So he has the leadership. He has the character. And the on the field play speaks for itself. Like he was the highest graded safety in coverage uh, per pro football focus. I think he had like a 92.9 in coverage uh, last year. Best in coverage among safeties, I should add. Um, but like, let me ask you this. D- did it make sense to draft him that early? Because I think people say, oh, well, why didn't you get a running back? Why didn't you get a Darnell Washington? Like those are guys <laughs> that could have gone. And like, does it make sense to get Jordan Battle in the third round? And, and if not, why is that? 
Well, I think it is. I think, and he, first of all, it's it's understated, but playing at Bama gives him an advantage coming into the NFL. And, and, you know, you play at these high-level schools, the Ohio State, the Bama's, it, it is a big deal. So we're talking about a guy now, I think you have to play to his strengths. He's got to be down in the box. He's got to be a run guy. He's six one. He's 2 and 9 He ran a four five five, so he can run a little bit. Uh, he's a – ability to process information is really good. So he's a guy when down in the box, he can help in the run game. He can be a run-fit guy. Um I love his balance. I love his ability to change direction. I love his physicality. Uh, he's not a great backpedaler, so he's not a safety in terms of uh, going to play on the half and be re- super successful in that. But he is a guy when he's down in the box or a guy who rolls up is going to be very successful. Could they have gone another route? Yeah, but, you know, sometimes they look at those guys, and, and those guys are – those safeties are undervalued in my opinion. And um, those they're, – they're the last line of defense. They have so much communication. they got to cover like a corner. they got to tackle like a linebacker, et cetera, et cetera. So – I think they're undervalued, and a guy like him, if you watch him on film, he is he is the heart and soul of that – one of the heart and souls of that Bama defense. So uh, his ability to run, his ability to make plays in the box, uh, playing for Nick Saban, uh, all those kind of things, I, I don't think it's a stretch at all. I think he's a, a really good pick for what the Bengals are trying to get to. And the Bengals – I mean, let's be honest. The Bengals got to keep keep people in front, tackle, and I'll score you. And that's what they're going to do, and, and that's what the NFL is all about now. So they got to get guys that can tackle, get people on the ground, and get the ball back to Burrow. You know, one of the things that Andrew and Mike and I talked about, and we were talking about kind of the winners and losers for the Bengals defense, you know, post-NFL draft at least, is, you know, is Jordan Battle a guy who is going to maybe have a chance to compete with Nick Scott? Because I would think they're set at free safety. They drafted Dax Hill in the first round. I think they trust him, and that would make sense, you know, to put Tyson Anderson behind him. But is Nick Scott really the guaranteed starter? Like, yeah, he's he's got a three-year deal. He's making $27 million, but is that job really his to lose, or is it really kind of a toss-up between him and Jordan Battle? Well, I don't see Jordan Battle's – I don't see him as a true free safety. I don't think that'll be a strength. I think he can do it because he's such a football player and been around the game, and, again, he's played at Bama, so he's had a bunch of different roles watching him on film. But he's going to be better down in the box. So anytime you're going to move him to the free safety and he's playing over the top exclusively – um, I'm not sure that's going to be his strength. I think you can use him back there. I think he can play on the half. I think he can play, you know, cover two and nickel situation, things like that because of his intelligence and, and his size. But he's going to be most successful down in that box, uh, you know, against 21 personnel and, and against these teams that are running these over routes and these things that p- teams try to get the ball. Because it's, it's not only a running game, it's the short passing game that I call an extension of the run. So, uh, a guy's got to be able to attack in space, not only in the running game, but those short passes that you get, you know, the RPOs, et cetera. So he's a guy that needs to be down the box tackling, um, and I think he'll make a big impact there. Much like Von Bell did for the last three years <laughs> is what you're saying? Correct. All right. Well, that gets us through about half of our draft picks. Uh, we're going to look at the next set of draft picks when we come back, and we're going to talk about a little Michigan-Ohio State rivalry when we get to one certain pick. I think you all know who that is. Stay tuned as we break down the rest of those picks right here on the Strictly Stripes podcast. All right. Thanks for staying with us on the Strictly Stripes podcast. Before we get into breaking down the second half of the Bengals draft picks from this year's draft, I want to remind you all to sign up for our Strictly Stripes newsletter. It is free. It is in your inbox every morning, and it takes just seconds to sign up. Go to cleveland.com slash newsletters. Click on the Strictly Stripes newsletter. You will get all of the latest reporting and insights and analysis from me, Mike, and Andrew. And if you want even more insights from us, Go to cleveland.com slash Bengals and sign up for our Cincinnati Football Insider subtext service. We will text you, the listener, the reader, the fan, however you describe yourself. And we will give you everything you need to know before Twitter, before the web, before we even get on the mic for this podcast. It's four ninety nine to sign up, but you get a two week free to try a two week free trial to start. And once you start, you're not going to stop. So go to cleveland.com slash Bengals and be a part of the best Bengals fan club out there. All right, Lance, so we talked about the Bengals' first three picks, with that being Miles Murphy, DJ Turner, and Jordan Battle. This is where I think things also get interesting, much like we talked about with Jordan Battle, and that is Chase Brown, the running back out of Illinois. Or no, I glossed over one pick. We're going to get to Brown. See, these picks all run together. I want to talk about Charlie Jones, who I know when I was talking to you earlier off the mic, you seemed very excited about him. You know, uh, one thing that the Bengals mentioned is I think he's primarily going to compete 
to be a slot receiver like Tyler Boyd, but, you know, he played all three positions in college, you know, left, right, inside. Um, and, you know, they're going to see what he can do, whether he's backing up the slot primarily or other positions. But, you know, he's also pretty good with special teams. Big Ten special teams player of the year two years ago. Um, had over a 1,000 combined kickoff and punt return yards in four years of college football. Why do you like the Charlie Jones pick, and what makes him so dangerous at so many positions? Well, the first thing, you know, he started off at Iowa, which is predominantly a run-based offense, and they went to Purdue, and, and I'm a big Jeff Brown fan. So what what, he, what you get as a guy in, in terms of coming to Cincinnati is you get a guy who understands route concepts, formations, uh, coverages, leverages of coverages. Uh, Brown runs a, a highly – high level offense uh, when he was at Purdue. So he comes in with knowledge uh, uh, better than some guys at his position. Uh, he ran a four, four, three. So when you think of Charlie Jones, you think of him as a slot possession type guy, but he ran a four, four, three. So he's a guy who's got some speed. Uh, he's, he's shorter. He's five eleven. He's about 175, 180 pounds. Uh, he's not super twitchy, but he's maximizes his ability. So he can play multiple positions because he understands what he's doing. And then again, he's got great separation skills. He he understands how to find blind spots and in, in hole and in holes and in, in zones. Uh, he's very good uh, against man coverage. He's very good at getting off press. Uh, he's got a full repertoire of moves. His press releases. Uh, again, he understands coverage. And when you understand coverage, you understand where the openings are going to be. He's very quarterback friendly in terms of quarterback friendly. That's kind of a term that's thrown out all the time. But basically, what it means is you understand the defense, and so does the quarterback. So both of you know where the hole is going to be, and then you're there. Uh, Jones does all that. And, again, uh, I know I texted you when we, we texted you right after the pick, and we were talking, and I was ecstatic for this pick um, because in terms of he's a much better athlete than people think he is. They think of him as a possession guy. This is a uh, boy type, uh, Julian Edelman type of guy who could do a lot of different things. Uh, and when you think about who's throwing the football, this is a guy who's going to flourish and could flourish early. Julian Edelman, that is an interesting comparison. What, where do you kind of get that one from? Why do you think he's like Julian Edelman? Well, just his ability to, you know, the, it's, it's like the Tyler Boyd. You know, Tyler Boyd, when you watch him, watch him on film, it's that ability to understand what the defense is doing. So many guys, you know, guys, especially guys, sometimes guys who play on the outside, they're just raw athletes. You get them the ball in space and they just go. The guys who play in the spot, slot, well, not only have to be athletes, but they got to understand the coverage and where, where leverage is coming from. Is it the underneath coverage from a backer? Is it the safety over top? Is it cover two? Is it cover three? Is it four? Is it a, is it a zone dog? Is it a, and Charlie Jones seems to understand that because he's always in the right spot. And when you're in the right spot, you're very quarterback friendly because quarterbacks know that because that's what the quarterbacks do for a living. They're, they understand where everybody's supposed to be. And when you do that as a receiver, you become very quarterback friendly. And when you watch him on film, just like when Edelman was playing with Brady, he understood where he's supposed to be all the time. It's like watching Boyd. Boyd always understands where he, you know, he's a really good slot receiver because he understands where he's supposed to be uh, in zone, in man, et cetera. Man, well, you know, it's funny because people, like you mentioned Tom Brady, like like Joe Burrow, for as young as he is, has been getting a lot of those Tom Brady comparisons. And, I mean, think about this. Like, Tyler Boyd's not going to be there forever. I was telling mm -hmm. Andrew and Mike, I think – Charlie Jones is going to replace him. I mean, no disrespect to Tyler Boyd, but he's about to be 30. The Bengals don't like to extend guys who aren't quarterbacks past that age, unless it's like a short-term deal like they did with A.J. Green at times. I, I just don't see them keeping him, no matter how well he does. Obviously, it's an even stronger case to not keep him if he doesn't do well. But, I mean, if Jones replaces Boyd, he's as young as he is, 24, 25 years old, I mean, are we looking at the next Tom Brady, Julian Edelman duo with Burrow and Jones? Well, yeah, because in, in obviously there's skill levels there, but you're talking about cognitive level in terms of guys who know where to go with the football and where to be with, when the football is thrown to them. And in both of those guys, there's a lot of guys like that. There's a lot of slot receivers that are really good at that. Uh, but Charlie Jones playing for Brom at Purdue, he's going to come in with a great understanding. Some of these guys that come in from college, they're just raw athletes. And he's a good athlete too, but he is a he's a guy who comes from Brom offense that's like, David Bell, when he went to the Browns, you know, he's, they have a knowledge that a lot of people don't have because they play for a guy in, in college who really has a high level, a high cognitive level of pass game. And, and there's no one who knows pass game as well as Brom. There's other guys who do it well too, but Brom is really good. So yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if they have a lot of success for sure. Yeah, it's been funny you mentioned Braum because he used to coach at a school I used to cover, WKU. Uh, I've never personally met him, but 
people in Bowling Green told me all about Brahms' offense, so I could see where that really helps out a guy like Charlie Jones, who will help out a guy like Joe Burrow. Um, but, you know, I think all of that makes sense. And I think, you know, like I said, we're not going to see much from him outside of being a potential punt returner if he beats out Trent Taylor for that job in training camp. So I think it's just going to be a matter of, like, him getting a handful of snaps unless he's, like, you know, the wide receiver four out of Trent and Irwin, and then maybe he gets even more snaps. We'll see. But I think it's just a matter of time before he takes off. But is it a matter of time before Chase Brown takes off? Because obviously it sounds like Joe Mixon, pending his legal situation and other matters, you know, with his cap salary and everything, you know, it seems to be the presumptive starter as the team's kind of been indicating. But, you know, it looks like Chase Brown is going to kind of – be the guy who competes with Travion Williams for that RB2 spot that, you know, obviously Samaj P. Ryan left. This is an interesting stat. I saw Chase Brown had the second best pass blocking grade among all running backs for PFF. I think his grade was like a 66 or somewhere around that ballpark. The Bengals really value pass, uh, pass blocking running backs is what they got out of Samaj P. Ryan. Most people, I mean, no one really did it better than him. Is this really uh, one of the best things that they're getting out of Chase Brown is his kind of pass blocking ability to protect protect Joe Burrow, or is there even more to it than that? There's more to it. So he's really good at that. And, you know, term I used to uh, always like to use is he loves to put his face in the fan. So he's not afraid to stick his nose in there and a blitzing back or, or chip. Uh, he also runs the swing pass very well, which is something the Cincinnati Bengals are very successful at. Uh, you know, talking about a guy who's 5'10", 209. He's fifth-year senior, so he's a little bit older, so he understands Highly productive guy. So you're talking about a guy who had 329 carries for 1,600 yards last year, also had 27 receptions. So he's a highly productive guy. Uh, he's very good in the shotgun. So some guys run well the shotgun, some guys don't. He's a guy that runs very well the shotgun. That's huge with the huge with the Bengals being in the shotgun so much. He's a guy who can kind of – he's kind of versatile, so he kind of gives you that uh, Swiss Army knife and being able to do multiple things at multiple times. Uh, yes, his pass protection is very good, but he's a football player. So it doesn't shock me. Um, he doesn't do a ton of, of blocking. That stat from PFF, you know, watching him, I watched a bunch of film on him. He does some, but when he does, he's super aggressive. But he's aggressive in everything he does. Uh, like I said, I like guys, you know, the, the edge of, you know, they got to be, you know, a young, uh, always young. He's 23 years old. He's mature. He's a fifth-year senior. Um, he puts his foot in the ground. Uh, he, You know, the Bengals run a, a pretty diverse run game. Uh, with gap schemes and zone schemes, he can run all those, uh, and he runs them both from underneath center and in the shotgun. So I think this is a great value pick. Um, those running backs, you get high value out of backs at any level. You got to find the right fit for your scheme, and you know, make no mistake, the Bengals are driven by Joe Burrow, and whatever is going to make Joe Burrow's uh, life easier is what they're going to go with, and this guy does that. So you, you, you mentioned all the attributes like him being a Swiss army knife and whatnot. I mean, I, I kind of talk about Charlie Jones the same way, but like while we're talking about Brown as a Swiss army knife, I mean, with all these things you're saying, is it almost too hard to pass him up and just make Travion Williams the RB2? Or do you think that's it? Like you just got to make Brown the RB2 pending a competition and training camp, obviously. But like, is, is it really kind of leaning towards him right now? Uh, you know, I, that's you know, as a coach, it's you got It's great on paper. He does a lot of good things. I love his mentality when he's playing. But I think those, you know, the thing that makes those guys better is when they have to compete in practice. And I've ta- had a, talked to a couple people in the last couple of days in terms of why would you draft a guy if you have a guy? Well, sometimes when you have a guy and you don't have any behind him, that guy gets complacent. So not that anybody's doing that, but when you challenge a guy and you bring in a guy that, you know, this is the NFL. So the next guy is always ready to go, and there's some really talented guys. So I don't think it's. I don't think it's bad to have high-level competition at, at, at those type of positions, especially running back. Those guys take a beating. So a lot of guys are going to play. You're going to get three to five guys a year that are going to get a carrier or, or two, you know, obviously if there's some injuries. So I don't think competition it, it, it is a bad thing ever, especially at the NFL level. Um, you're trying to maximize, especially a team like the Bengals, they're trying to figure out the pieces to finish the puzzle. And a guy like Chase Brown might be a guy who does that for whatever reason. But they're – they're not a team that's drafting for uh, the franchise guys. They got those guys. They are now drafting to finish the puzzle. And, uh, you know, Chase Brown is a guy who can do that. You know, uh, it's funny that you mentioned the puzzle. Like, that's something Mike Nizek always says is, like, this team is one, maybe two players away from a Super Bowl. And I certainly believe Miles Murphy's one of them just because of the <laughs> lack of pass rush juice they had last year. And maybe, just maybe, with respect to the other guys we've talked about and that we're going to talk about, 
Chase Brown might be that other piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, because Samaj J. P. Ride's gone, and you need a pass blocking back who can do many things, and it sounds like this is exactly what he does. But jumping into our third to final pick, uh, an interesting one, obviously, uh, Brad Robbins, the second Wolverine the Bengals drafted last week. The best hang time in college football. He didn't have any touchbacks, which is amazing given the level of competition he faced. Obviously, he's still got to compete with Drew Chrisman, a fellow Ohio State Buckeye. So you're essentially getting the game in terms of a re- 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 reiteration. That's the word, reiteration of that uh, in a training camp battle for punter. I think at this point, it's Robbins' job to lose, but, like, why is it his job to lose? Like, why did the Bengals make the right move using an additional six-round pick they traded for to draft him? Well, you know, when you look at it, here's here's the way I look at it. Again, we talked about the Bengals being in the, at the point in the, where they're trying to complete the puzzle. They're, they're getting pieces, parts to make everything work a little bit better. So, for me, special teams comes down to flipping the field. So, the more that you can make that team opposing team drive, it's really hard to do, even at the NFL level. When that ball is inside the 20 and you fit the field and they have to go 80 yards plus, that's 10 to 12 plays. It's hard to go 10 to 12 plays without making a mistake. So the more that you can get a punter that can do that, the more that you can down the ball inside the 20, the the, the, the numbers show that when you're inside the 20 as compared to outside the 20 and, and t- scoring touchdowns or points, it's so drastic. So – I think for the Bengals, they're, they're, again, they're finishing the puzzle or they're, they're thinking to themselves, what do we have to do to finish this puzzle? Well, to help that defense out, let's make teams go 80 yards. Let's make teams go 85, 90 yards to get a point. If they have to do that, um, it's going to be tough to do because there's take so, uh, so many plays. So that to me, why it makes sense, a, a kicker, a, a kicker who can flip the field um, and make the other team start in time of 20 is, is a vital thing for a football team. You know, I, I was going to say, I kind of talked with Andrew and Mike about this. Like, is there any chance whatsoever that we see a potential win from Drew Chrisman? Like, can he save his job or does he just have to do what he can and just hope that he ends up staying on the practice squad? Like, what do you think happens there? Well, that's really tough. When you draft a kicker, they're expecting you to be the, the guy, right? So that's going to be very tough. They they wouldn't draft him unless they thought that was a concern. Um, whatever it may be, whether it's warranted or not, they had they felt that 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 area was not um, as good as it needed to be to get them over the top. So obviously, I don't know the numbers in front of me. Some I, I, those are the type of things I like to study. But what was his ability to flip the field? How often did he flip the field? How often did he flip the field uh, and make the other team go long distances in crucial situations? What was his what was his average uh, in, when they needed to flip the field? So meaning that like. You don't have a good drive. You're on your own five. You put out of your end zone. How how well did he do that? So those little things for me are, are you know, those are the numbers, the inside numbers that those coaches know. But they felt that something wasn't quite what they wanted. So it'd be very hard for me to see Rob, that Rob is not being the guy. I think that speaks for itself. Another six-round pick that doesn't quite speak for itself, though, is Andre Yoshivas, uh, who was picked right before Robbins. I kind of sidestepped uh, Yoshivas there because, like I said, these picks just all run together, especially when they're both six-rounders. I would imagine there's going to be nothing more than him being a special teams guy uh, coming into next year. But at the same time, we talked about Charlie Jones being that Swiss Army knife. It doesn't quite mean that there can't be a role for uh, Andre Yoshivas to be a – you know, a guy who plays behind a T. Higgins or Jamar Chase because he's got size, he's got speed, he's a heptathlete, he played multiple sports, including body surfing, by the way, fun fact. So with all of that, I mean, can you anticipate a situation where, like, God forbid, Jamar Chase or T. Higgins, either of them go down next year with injury, and you can only get so much out of Charlie Jones, do you see Andre Yoshivas being, like, a lottery ticket of a draft pick that they got? Well, I'll tell you what. So the thing I've learned about the draft, and, and obviously over the last couple of years, I've been doing this a lot now. So I'm watching lots of guys on film. And the one thing I notice about a lot of people when they draft, especially in the fifth, sixth, and seventh round, you're looking for elite traits. You're looking for guys who maybe haven't reached their potential, uh, played at a small school, but they have these elite traits. This guy has the elite traits. So he comes out of Princeton. He's 6'5", he's 203. So he runs a 4'4'3", which was slow for him. There was chance that there was uh, thoughts of him running in the high 4'2's. So four two four three. So this is a guy that they thought was going to be an elite speed guy. Uh, he's got so he's got those 
elite sk uh, speed skills with size. He had a 39 inch vertical leap. He had a, a 1.52 10 yard uh, uh, split, which is, it means he gets off the ball really, really well. Uh, he had a 10 6 broad jump. Um, you know, and then he then he reps 19 at 225. So he's strong, he's fast. Uh, again, he has these elite, elite traits. Now he's played at a lower level. So a lot of teams immediately look away from that. Uh, but I think the value you get with a guy who has elite speed, elite size, uh, elite ability to go get the football in the air, he's a high point guy. So I've always talked about receivers uh, in three phases, the ability to get off the ball, the catch point and run after catch. His ability to high point the ball makes him a red, throne, red zone threat from day one. Then he can use all those other skills, and, and those guys in the NFL, those receiver coaches are good. So they're going to maximize his potential. You can't maximize potential if it's not there. A late round pick, you get a guy like this, at, you know, at number, what is it, 206. You're talking about a guy who has a ton of athletic ability, a ton of athletic ability, and could possibly, um, you know, coming in, if he can learn the offense, uh, you know, he went to Princeton, so you know he's a smart kid. So, you know, you, you, you're talking about a guy who I think um, could really make some noise if he can. I had him January 9th is the first time I broke him down, and I loved him on film, and I love his set for all the things I talked about. Uh, I think those carry over well to the NFL. I think he'll be a better NFL player than he was a college player. Really? Better in NFL than college? And it doesn't mean he'll make the team. I'm just saying I think when he gets coached up and he is playing against elite-level competition and coached at elite level – um, he does things you can't coach. And, um, you know, there's a lot of guys that don't, that doesn't pan out. And I've been wrong on a lot of guys, that's for sure. But this guy sh certainly fits the bill when you talk about how are you going to mold a receiver and how are you going to make an athlete and how are you going to, uh, what are some traits you want to give them? This guy's got them. So I think it's, I think it was a, a great value pick, uh, this late in the draft. Yeah, I mean, obviously, when you're a six-round pick, the, the question of whether you make the team or not, it's always going to swirl mm -hmm. above, you know, your head. But, I think that's applicable to our last and final pick, who I don't think there's much to discuss, but there is something to discuss, and that's obviously uh, DJ Ivy, who uh, the Bengals drafted out of Miami as their eighth and final draft pick. I mean, really, the first thing that stood out to me was like, okay, you drafted him, you drafted DJ Turner. You can pretty much say that, you know, Trey Flowers and Eli Apple are not coming back. I mean, obviously, they're both still free agents. So they could come back, but I think uh, drafting Ivy closed the door on that. So obviously now Apple and Flowers have to hope they get a deal before training camp. Um, but with Ivy, I think a lot of us in the media room kind of looked at each other like, who is this guy? <laughs> and so I don't know. I, I still don't really know much about him other than sort of the numbers I, I looked up from his pro day at Miami. What do you know about DJ Ivy that I probably don't know? And – I mean, obviously, he's going to be probably your next Alan George, a backup next to Sidney Jones, but, like, anything worth noting? Because he's still a seventh-round pick, right? Well, you know, these are the guys I love to watch. These are the guys that, you know, people don't understand how eerily uh, close that he is to being a first-rounder. Just small traits, right, it, for everybody, not just him, just everybody. So he's a guy, he's a 4-4 guy, he's 4-4-8 guy, so he can run. Again, theme of their draft is guys who can run. Um Quicker than he is fast, so he's really good in a short area. Some of his short burst tests show that. Um, really like his physicality in the run game. I like his physicality against receivers. I like how he takes the challenge of receivers. He's very good in press coverage. Um, his hips aren't great. So when you talk about hips, his ability to get in and out of his back pedal. So when he's backpedaling and a guy runs a route, can he transition from the back pedal into turning his hips and going? That at times on film is slow. So that could, that when you're slow on that, that takes away from your raw straight line speed, which is really good from him, which is 448. So uh, that's what kind of moved him to the seventh round. But he's the guy who can run. So again, you're talking about a guy who can carry people deep, uh, can run with people deep, keep things in front. Uh, I think for the you know when you have the when you have one of the top two to three quarterbacks in the league, everything you do is revolved around him. So for me, taking him is a, is he a guy that can cover kicks? Is he a guy that can? make the game-saving tackle to keep, you know, a running back from getting in the end zone. Can he play in the nickel and dime to make sure that nothing gets behind him when the Bengals are up six with two minutes to go? There's a bunch of different reasons that a coach would pick him. Obviously, I'm not going to be in the coach's head, but being a former coach, that's what I would say. You know, what, what, what does he bring? What piece of the puzzle? You know, the Bengals draft a lot differently than the Texans, right, because they're, they're, they're in different spots. So he is a guy who they like. He's a guy they liked on film. I liked his film. Um, you know, I had, I had broken him down, uh, in late January, just because you, you go through a list of DBs that you like and you see. And, um, 
I would say his big his big down, the reason he's in the seventh round is because his hips aren't great and he doesn't sink very well and he doesn't turn very well. Um, but it's maybe something he could be taught. Maybe he wasn't taught that and maybe those guys with the Bengals think they can do that. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, with any cornerback and obviously a wide receiver too, like you got to have really good hips. Mm-hmm. You know, I was joking with uh, was David Campbell, our amazing sports editor. I was telling him, Jamar Chase's hips don't lie, like like Shakira once said, because, I mean, I saw a video of him power clean lifting 315 pounds, which, I mean, what, when you're six foot, just a hair over 200 pounds, I mean, like, good God almighty, those hips don't lie. But, yeah, I mean, when you're a cornerback and your hips are slow, then there's a reason why people like Jamar Chase have a field day with you. So we're going to see what happens with him. I mean, he's got to make the team too. I mean, mm-hmm. they obviously still have depth with, you know, Alan George, who, I mean, he was an undrafted guy and he made the 53 man roster late in the year last year. You got Sidney Jones, who they signed on a one year deal. Maybe he makes a practice squad for a year. Maybe he's elevated in 2024. Who knows? But, you know, nonetheless, that's a pick worth mentioning. Final thoughts to kind of round this up. You, you mentioned speed was one of the unique traits from this year's draft class. And I actually wrote about that this week on cleveland.com. For those who want to go read it, uh, cleveland.com slash Bengals. But what is another unique trait or unique traits that sticks out about this year's draft class? Well, for me, it's a, like we've talked about during this pod, is their their ability to find these pieces, right? Murphy, uh, Turner, these guys, the punter, these guys that can kind of, they're trying to finish the puzzle. So with the, I think the Bengals went out and they said, they, they took best available, but they also said, we need these particular things to get better. And they took the best available at those positions. So uh, I think Murphy was a steal. I think Turner's a guy who can uh, compete for a starting corner spot. I think he's a guy who can play uh, inside. Um, if they need him in the nickel, he can play on the slot. So I, th- I just think they went out and they got guys who can compete. They got the guys who have traits that could possibly get better. So not only did they, you know, like Usavis, he's a guy who could be good down the road. And, may- and maybe this, you know, Ivy can be good because they have some traits that give him that. But what stands out to these teams that are at that Super Bowl level, when you look at their when you look at their drafts, and I have all the drafts in front of me, is the idea of they're finishing – where other teams are trying to get to get to a point, right? They're trying to get the franchise quarterback in the back and the, the linebacker and the, the, the DT and the edge guy and all those kind of guys. The Bengals are set, and the Bengals are trying to figure out how did they get over the top? How did they finish it? And they finish it with field position. They finish it with keeping people in front, and they finish it with, um, you know, being able to get more than 30 sacks in a season, you know, the, that which they, you know, they only had 30 sacks last year. So how do you improve that? Well, you go out and get Miles Murphy. So I, I thought the idea that they fill, filled their needs to potentially get them to the Super Bowl was pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, I, I really believe that Duke Tobin in that front office just put this together like a Super Bowl contending team. I mean, I don't know if you can compare them to guys like Brenton Veach because, I mean, you look at what they did last year, Trent McDuffie, Joshua Williams. I mean, Isaiah Pacheco, a seventh-round pick who people would have written off with, you know, the fact they already had Clyde edwards alaire like – he has a great game in the Super Bowl. And, like, Williams was a big reason why, like, Burrow got picked in the AFC Championship. And McDuffie was a part of it. Jalen Watson, like, I mean, they just had a lot of guys in that draft. And I wonder if, like, this draft compares to, like, what the Chiefs did last year. Like, getting guys all across the board, different positions, first to seventh round picks. I mean, we'll just have to wait and see. I'm, I'm very intrigued to see, like, how this all comes together. But, I mean, if the Bengals win the Super Bowl – and at least half of these picks make a difference like Chiefs' picks did last year, we could be looking saying, man, like Duke Tobin really is like better, if not like just as good as Brett Le- Brett Veach and uh, other guys out there. So, yeah, I mean, would you, what would you grade the Bengals draft, by the way? I didn't ask you, like, what would you give them as a grade? Well, I, you know, I, for what they had to do, I give them, I give them a B plus. And just Same. because you know, it's, I would give them a B plus. And, and, but I, I always think it's hard to uh, evaluate non guys who you don't think are going to be franchise guys. So no, when you're grading, you know, you're grading CJ Stroud and you're grade, grading Bryce Young, well, you're going to get an immediate kind of feedback, right? So you're going to get, this is what happens. Was it worth the pick with the Bengals, you know, with their picks because of their talent level right now, you know, you're going to have to see down the line, you know, these guys don't have to be impact players like a Bryce Young. These guys have to be impact players, make plays of special teams, fill in if somebody gets injured for a game or a quarter, uh, make a play on punt team, uh, be a good kick returner, cover a nickel, you know, things that they don't have to be the guy. So to evaluate, I evaluate more of the plan. The plan seemed to be we got to fill these holes 
or fill these voids and go out and fill them. So in that case, it's an A. It, skill wise, you have to wait. I, you know, I, 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 always, I agree with you know two to three years with a non uh, franchise type draft is what you got to wait for. Do these guys grow and uh, how good can they be? Only time will tell. Only time will tell. And speaking of time, never enough time on this podcast, but that is Lance Reisland, our amazing, as always, Cleveland.com special contributor who breaks down film better than anybody in the business. Lance, always a pleasure. I know I'll be having you on very soon. I don't know how soon, but hopefully soon enough. We appreciate your time on this podcast. As always, Mohammed. Thanks for having me, buddy. Likewise. Once again, for myself and our special guest, Lance Reisland, I'm Mohammed Ahmad. Stay tuned next week. Me, Mike and Andrew will kick things off looking at the biggest questions for the Bengals going into the rest of workouts and much more. But until then, we will see you on Monday. Enjoy your week.